So Alzheimer's, a type of memory loss, is very common and very devastating. So it's estimated that over 6 million adults in the United States alone are living with Alzheimer's. And past the age of 65, it's something like 11%, which is about 1 in 9. And past the age of 85, it's about 35%. So about a third of the adults past that age are living with Alzheimer's at this point in time. And those numbers, I think they continue to go up because we have kind of an expanding aging population. So it's it's a miserable condition. If you've ever seen it, you know. Uh, if you have a family member or or anyone that you've seen. And I see it in the emergency room all the time. I've had some extended family, so I've seen this quite a bit myself. So people that previously could take care of themselves and do their normal activities all of a sudden are basically completely helpless. And, you know, the quality of life is basically nil because they just like they don't even know who their family members are anymore and, and all these things like that. So not too long ago, Alzheimer's was considered a progressive, irreversible condition, kind of like type 2 diabetes in that respect. And also the treatment for Alzheimer's has been really mysterious. Like, is there anything we can actually do to help these people? But that is gradually starting to change. And so in this video, I'm going to explain a little bit more about how you can prevent Alzheimer's, including what are the main underlying causes of Alzheimer's, how you can avoid those causes, avoid those problems through lifestyle changes, even without any specific medical treatment. I'll also explain how this fits into a specific program for preventing Alzheimer's designed by Dr. Dale Bredesen, a neurologist who's written multiple books about Alzheimer's. And I'll explain his, um, his methodology called Ketoflex 12.3, what that means and how you can put at least certain elements of that into practice. FYI, I also have a podcast and a blog post on this topic that go a little bit more in depth, so I'll put links to those below in case you want to check those out. Final note before we dive in, personally, I always find it really motivating when I learn how certain healthy lifestyle changes can prevent devastating conditions or diseases like Alzheimer's or like heart attacks or like type 2 diabetes. So I think once you get to the end of this discussion, you'll similarly find it very motivating to make some healthy lifestyle changes so that you can hopefully prevent Alzheimer's. So not too long ago, I heard Dr. Dale Bredesen uh, interviewed on a podcast, and I'd heard him talk before, but this was a good reminder and an update. Dr. Bredesen is a neurologist. He's worked with a lot of patients who have Alzheimer's. He's come up with a program that's worked pretty well, and he's written some books about it. And so ultimately, his program uh, has been able to to be pretty effective at preventing Alzheimer's and also have some improvements. Even in early cases, they've often been able to reverse it. And in more advanced cases, they're often able to see at least a little bit of improvement, but not complete reversal in that case. So when I say early Alzheimer's, what I mean is when the symptoms are like kind of not that bad where you're still kind of like, well, is this old age or is this Alzheimer's? So it's usually within the first 10 years or so after it kind of starts to develop. And in those cases, they're usually able to reverse the, the condition, which is pretty amazing, really. So on that podcast, Dr. Bredesen shared one really specific story about a 73-year-old lady. She was a psychiatrist and she started to develop Alzheimer's symptoms. Her husband noticed that she was really changing and couldn't function as well. And so before she started Dr. Bredesen's program, she was in, they did some memory testing and she was in about the ninth percentile. So in that kind of bottom 10% or so of people. Um, and they did some brain scans of some sort and they did, were able to see, they were able to see some early signs of Alzheimer's. And then after she went through the program and made these various changes, including nutritional changes, I think there was one specific infection that they treated, and then some hormone changes, uh, so a variety of things, but um, you know, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Ultimately, she was able to go from that ninth percentile up to the 97th percentile on her memory test, and then the brain scan didn't show any signs of of, of Alzheimer's anymore, that it, whatever signs it had shown previously. Her neurologist was super impressed. And uh, Dr. Bredesen also noted that her friends were no longer able to cheat her on the golf course. So it was some pretty, pretty impressive results. So with all that being said, Dr. Bredesen pointed out during that podcast that there are two main underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease. And they're not the only causes, but they're just like the most common and, and cover the majority of cases. Uh, so these two main causes are insulin resistance and inflammation. So let's talk just a little bit about each one. So insulin resistance is a, a common 
issue where people have high blood sugar and high insulin most of the time. And so what that ultimately means is it's people like those that have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And so their blood sugar runs high and their insulin level also runs high. And so insulin is that hormone that comes from your pancreas. It kind of gets pumped out whenever you eat carbohydrates. And if you have too much of it because you're eating a lot of sugar and starch, um, then after a while your body kind of turns down the response and insulin doesn't work as well in your body. So that's insulin resistance. But how does that affect your brain? Well, specifically in the brain, what that means is that if insulin isn't working as well, not as much glucose is able to get into your brain. So your brain, even though there's, an, there's plenty of glucose out there in the bloodstream, the brain's kind of starving. So there's an energy crisis in the brain. The brain doesn't have enough energy, and that's because of this insulin resistance. So you can have plenty of sugar, but it's not getting to the place where, you're, where, where it's needed. Um, and that's why sometimes Alzheimer's has been called type 3 diabetes is because it has a lot to do with blood sugar and insulin resistance. The other main major or main underlying cause of Alzheimer's is inflammation. So inflammation, of course, is a good thing. It's a necessary thing uh, for life, <laughs> basically, because it does a bunch of important things in our body, like fighting off infections or helping us heal wounds, etc., but there are a lot of different medical problems where you can get excessive inflammation too. And one of those is Alzheimer's. And so that if there's inflammation and, and it's affecting the brain, then that can lead to problems, including memory problems. So once I heard that those were the two main underlying causes of Alzheimer's, I made a connection. And that is fasting is pretty good at treating both of those underlying causes. Just, I, I'm, I already know that even without hearing Dr. Bredesen talk. I know that fasting is quite effective at treating insulin resistance, including high blood sugar and high insulin. Um, and fasting is also pretty good at reducing overall inflammation in the body. So it made sense to me like, okay, fasting can probably be a useful tool in this regard. And then also, a ketogenic diet or nutritional ketosis is also pretty effective at treating both of those underlying causes um, because it's good at lowering blood sugar, lowering insulin, fixing insulin resistance, and also a ketogenic diet has some positive effects on inflammation as well. So I thought about it and I was like, huh, fasting and keto probably would be helpful. And it turns out, spoiler alert, Fasting and ketosis are really significant parts of Dr. Bredesen's program for preventing and treating Alzheimer's. So Dr. Bredesen has a protocol that he uses with his patients called KetoFlex 12-3. So keto, you can probably imagine, has to do with the ketogenic diet or ketosis. Flex, uh, I guess, means flexitarian, meaning like the amount of meat is flexible. And then the 12-3 I'll get to in just a second. So the basic idea, the high-level kind of summary of this KetoFlex 12-3 is that a patient doing this would avoid sugar, grains, and conventional dairy. They would eat a lot of nutri nutrient-rich plants, so vegetables and fruits and things like that. They would get healthy fats and high-quality protein in their diet. And then they would do a minimum of three hours of fasting before bedtime. So they wouldn't eat for at least three hours before bedtime. And then a minimum of 12 hours total fasting overnight from the time that you... So in other words, from the time you have dinner one day, maybe 8 p.m. or whatever, until you eat again the next day would be at least 12 hours. So that's where the 12-3 comes from. So this KetoFlex 12-3 protocol, as you can tell, it's a combination of fasting or time-restricted eating with the 12-3. And the keto part means that you would get into ketosis at least off and on. It wouldn't have to be constant all the time, but you'd make a point of getting into ketosis through either eating a low carb, high fat. So that's nutritional ketosis or through the fasting component, which would help you boost your ketones a bit or taking and or taking a uh, ketone supplement. So fasting and ketosis are at the foundation of this nutritional protocol, which has been shown to be quite successful in the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's. Now, again, those aren't the only treatments that he's using or that they're using in their program. For example, they also test for some specific infections and treat those if needed. They check certain hormone levels. They look for vitamin deficiencies. Um, they also look for like heavy metal, heavy metal toxicities and things like that. And here's a quick little tangent. It, it was kind of crazy. Dr. Bredesen shared that well, he estimates that mercury poisoning 
probably accounts for about 3% of patients with Alzheimer's. Uh, but in most cases, they just don't know that. And so they're just kind of being treated like any old Alzheimer's patient, but it's really perhaps the mercury poisoning that's causing it. And if it's 3%, that doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're talking about millions and millions of people, 3% of that is actually quite a few people where they could probably get a lot better if they treated their mercury poisoning. So that's just like a small subset. But in the vast, vast majority of cases, it's mainly the the insulin resistance and the inflammation that, that we talked about earlier, which are the primary underlying causes of Alzheimer's. And therefore, the main things that you would want to target if you're trying to prevent or treat Alzheimer's. So what are you going to do with this information? Well, I imagine if you're watching this, it's because you have a family history of Alzheimer's or maybe a genetic predisposition or you're just kind of worried about it or maybe your spouse has some early symptoms or, or what have you. So there's probably a specific reason. And since this was just kind of a teaser, kind of a high-level summary, I'd recommend you check out at least one of Dr. Bredesen's books. He's got a few different books. There's the original book and then another one that's a little more practical and then the third one that kind of has specific stories and case studies about people that have um, basically cured Alzheimer's or improved from Alzheimer's. So I'll put links to all three of those below and also a link to a free trial on audible if you want to try listening to the audiobook version of one of those i think they're on audible i'll have to double check <laughs> but in addition to getting one of those books you may want to consider implementing one of the main two components of the ketoflex 12-3 program and those main two components are intermittent fasting on the one hand and ketosis on the other hand so there are various ways you could do it um, you know a ketogenic diet with a little bit of time-restricted eating, and voila, you're there. But you don't have to go full board from day one. You could kind of ease into it gradually. So I have a playlist right here that has a bunch of beginner tips about how to get started with intermittent fasting, so you may find that helpful. I also have a few podcasts and blog posts about how to do a ketogenic diet, and it kind of walks you through it from the very beginning, so I'll put links to those in the description below. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next video.